Hi guys, welcome again to, I think it's the fourth or maybe the fourth episode of the Raj Call podcast, I think so. I've lost count already because I don't do it as uh, as uh, often as I'd like. But today I've got a very uh, special guest again, who's actually become a very good friend of mine and, and a friend of my wife's, uh, who's uh, Sonia Panasar. So I'm going to I'm gonna uh, jump over to her and let her introduce herself first. Over to you, Sonia. Hi, thanks Raj um, for having me on. Uh, this is amazing. So guys and girls listening, everyone listening, I'm Sonia Vanessa um, and I am an independent singer, songwriter, born and bred in the UK and been serving the so-called British Asian music industry for many, many years, uh, whether it's through recording or um, uh, through live uh, entertainment as well. I think that's the brief version, Raj. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, see, see I, the thing I did, I pronounced your name the Gora way. I, I, I oh, said, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Vanessa. Yeah, Vanessa, yeah. So I, I, I need to get told off with a smack, smack on my head. It's like when people call me, call me Raj. Like, especially in Birmingham, it's Raj. <laughs> it's Raj. Oh, yeah, of course. No, so it's Sonia Vanessa. No, it's okay. I, I, I've got a tendency of saying it the right way because I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a fanatic of my mother tongue, my Punjabi mother tongue. And uh, I'm not saying nobody else isn't. It's just the way that I am. I've got this habit of saying it the right way. <laughs> so. She's like my mum. She's, she even, she's born here, but she's her Punjabi. She teaches Punjabi and stuff. But even she calls me Raj sometimes. <laughs> It's like, okay. no, it's just... uh, I don't know maybe that's a I, well I'm London based I, I always have this tendency that everyone up north pronounces things differently <laughs> so yeah, me, me, and, me, and, me and Ruby my wife always have this debate is it, is yeah. it bath or bath or... Oh, so you would still be Raj in London but I'm, I'm assuming up north you're Raj <laughs> yeah yeah there you go might be something to do with it but yeah I'm Sonia Vanessa or Panessa if you like to call it Vanessa is better, better actually <laughs> authentic okay so let's get straight into this um tell me about how um so i, I try not to make this small question you know, i just want a conversation to flow as it as it is because you're a bubbly character in any way you've you got a great uh, personality about you and a great charisma which comes through so uh it, it it's sort of nice that when the conversation just flows automatically so but i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna give you a little question just tell us tell us about your background because i i know a bit about you but not as much as i'd like to do so it's an education experience for me as well tell me about your background in terms of how you got into singing okay so i'm gonna start at the very beginning so at the age of four um my mum introduced me to music through Shabbat Gitan. Um, so um, she took me to Gitan classes to learn um, how to play the Vajra and to sing and obviously learn the, the Shabbat Gitan that, that we do at the Gurdwaras. So I started there at the age of four. Um, it might have been just before four because I actually did my first Gitan performance at four. So I've got a feeling it was a little bit before four. <clears throat> and I learned from... Gyan Singh Surjit, who was a blind Gyanni, actually. He's uh, sadly passed away now, but he was a blind Gyanni. So I feel like I'm quite fortunate to have learned from someone who had a different sense of sound as well, um, actually. And that's a whole discussion in itself. But that was my first teacher. Um, sidelining that along the way, I've had um, a female teacher as well, Darshan Korsur, who was... As a, as a young girl growing up, I was quite inspired by. She was the first auntie that I saw playing the tabla. And wow. she played it so well. But she also taught Gitan um, classes like after school classes at school halls and things like that. Um, she taught tabla and vajja. So we had that sidelining as well. That's I'm talking about when I'm a bit older, sort of eight, nine maybe. Um, but Gyan Singh Sujit, that teaching never left me. That was still there. We were still going to his classes. Um and so I had the teachings of both and I'm sort of trying to think now so from the learning aspect from it was always Gitan based I didn't go out to learn songs or anything it was always Gitan based so with the Gitan Gyan Singh Sujit's teachings mainly he had this whole organization where he taught Indian classical theory um, he actually had a center uh, alongside his double uh, G known as Hamdard now he was he's very famous and well known I don't, in definitely in london i don't know um in other areas but you don't know that, sorry hamdard hamdard his name is so 
people that are in the double G kind of clan, they will know, they will know that he was a renowned double G. So they had this centre based in London where they taught Indian classical theory. Would you also explain to the listeners what that means? Uh, which 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 word or what? The word double G. Yeah. Sorry, double player. Double G, okay. double yeah. player. That, uh, that, uh, it's, so no one's going to know what that, that no, means. No, of course. And yeah, please yeah. prompt me. Please prompt me. Exactly, and I'll yeah. do my best to explain because it's normal for me, but exactly, it might not be yeah. normal to others. Um, so they had this centre or base in um, South or West London when we went and um, we learned Gitan. So Gitan is your your um, hymns, your your Sikh religious hymns that we were learning that are all to do with faith. But the Indian classical theory was being taught, sidelining that. So we actually sat, I say we, I'm talking about me and my brother, because my brother was always with me in these things. And my brother is four years younger than me. And um, we both attended the, the, I did the harmonium and the Gitan, and he did the Dabla. And we learned rags, the classical scales of Indian music, very heavily. Um, we sat exams, we sat theoretical exams, practical exams, wow. certificates, and these certificates were apparently, you know, like like we have a GCSE exam. We had it was it, there was a real examining board that was assessing this stuff. Um, a real examiner would come in and assess me at, or us in groups or on our, on our own as individuals. And then we'd get issued a certificate. So it was a real serious thing that was going on. It wasn't just rocking up at a good or learning how to sing this show, but then off you go. It was a real, real training um, and very um, disciplined as well. So Gyan Singh Sujit, when he was teaching me, I'd remember, I'm going to kind of mimic it if I can on camera. Um, imagine this is my knee. And he'd, if I go out of time, it was <laughs> out of time or no, sing it again. You're, you're off, sur, off, off key. There were some serious, you know, um, kind of. Those were the good old days, though, weren't they? <laughs> they, they were the, I mean, I didn't get hit otherwise. So there was no a, a sort of real physical abuse. I wouldn't say it's real, but it was. A, oh, it's, uh, of course. But it's, it's, it's the good old days that they, it meant so much to them. Real discipline. Like, discipline yeah, exactly. key. So I think because of that regimented discipline, that one-to-one sort of, you know, there was a room full of students learning at different paces and we were all kind of waiting our turn to be called up and it was quite traditional in the way that I learned. But that one-to-one valuable time, I can't I can't knock that. And I'm very grateful that, you know, my mum took us there. Um, so I've had that training. That's over the early years of my as a child growing up and absorbing music, that was some seriously heavy training that I had. And then I can't remember exactly what happened at what time, but I remember turning, sort of going to perform more Gitan at Gurdwara, so temples, um, and then turning up to like, there was a lot of like, you would have on a Monday, it'll be women that just did Gitan on a Monday, for example, on a Friday it was kids and they'll have a whole, uh, event just for kids every Friday and I'd start participating in those things and it became quite regular quite became quite the norm and the more I sang the more I'd get asked to keep on turning up to the like, can you come on Sunday and sing another one and it just became kind of you know the thing that we did or the thing that I certainly did sidelining that though um, that's the learning aspect and there's more to that story a little bit later but so thinking from the age of four that's going on Whilst I was singing and performing Kirtan, um, at the age of seven or six, um, my mamaji, my mum's first cousin brother, maternal brother, asked uh, had an event uh, at his house and he asked me to do Kirtan at his house because people get that done for blessings and so on. And I asked, I did one Shabbat. And uh, as a result of that, he asked me, okay, I'd like to book you in the studio. So who who are we talking about? We're talking about Kuljit Bamra. Kuljit Bamra is my mum's first and first oh, cousin. Enough. Yeah. So Kuljit Bamra is a renowned producer. He's been here in the UK serving British Asian music and mainstream music, theatre music. Um, people might know him for being um, the uh, producer behind Real Gaddi. Um, so many classics, legends. There's so many classic legends he's worked with, and of course, he's he's still serving the industry now. Is 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 amazing what he's done. He's my mama G that heard me that day and said, "Right, I'm going to book you in the studio." 
and little girl me seven-year-old my mum was like got me dressed up in like a nice colorful dress off I go to the studio taking her daughter to the studio and I sang on um I recorded in my very high-pitched girly voice um for an album called Ishk Ishk uh by Gormal back in the day it was on a vinyl and all I had to do was sing Ishk Ishk Shaba Ishk Ishk right at the top of my voice you, were you like the harmonies that all the chorus at the yeah, back? Yeah, so those little girls, those screechy girls in the back <laughs> <laughs> that we've grown up listening to in Bhangra music. I did a lot of that voice work growing wow. up. It started with Gormal's Ishk Ish. And then with Kojit um, uh, Bhamra, he's he's just, um, I'm going to call him Mamaji. Sorry, it's really weird for me to call him. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so with Mamaji, he's like, Okay, he's he's like, okay, I've got another project, got another project, got another project, and so on. So basically, as a result of this, I started doing recording projects as a chorus singer for various projects. So I have now recorded, I think, 30, 40 albums chorus-wise wow. through so him and his studio age. experience at a young age. At a young age. So I'm just trying to explain. So I know what you've asked me is where did you start? How did it happen? There's actually two things. There's a the learning aspect, then there's a the recording studio aspect. And I've worked with Hindi alternative artists, the Bhangra scene as well. And then, you know, back in the day, people were looking for, oh, does anyone know a female singer that can do this part? It meant that I started then working with the likes of Sukshinda Shinda, Jazzy B, wow. Gumar Hina. I didn't know that. People, yeah. But as a chorus singer in the background. So That's a lot cool. of it. It's, it's massive. It's a little massive. Yeah, massive it is. Part. It is. So I got the opportunity to work with all these people. I worked with... Um, uh, Shake um, from Kiss Records as well with some of his artists, Bin the Munde back in the day, and there were so many. So I was going up and down to Kidderminster to Pete Ware Studio. This is when I'm a bit older now. Um, Planet Studios with Sukshinda Shindaji was, um, and then in Southall there was various studios. So I've had that going along whilst I was still learning only Keaton, yeah. and um, and then I can't remember what happened at what stage, but I had a change of teacher um and he was a very very also very disciplined classical um teacher that nobody really knew about at that time his brother um was known Mourn Singh Musapuri uh, is his brother's name um people knew him as a classical um Raggi Raggi again is, is is down the whole Shabad Gitan classical route so but his brother Jagjit Singh Thiraj who again has passed away sadly I had a few years of some seriously solid training from him where every little note had to be said, sung a certain way. It was, I was doing riyaz two hours a day as a child, you know, after school, any time. And if I didn't do it, it was some serious pressure. Um, learning every sargam, every scale, every, it's, it's, it was something else. It was like a, it could be a separate life. This is while you're in full-time education as well. Yes, yeah. while I'm in full-time education, going to school like a normal child. Um, so I feel quite fortunate that I had that going on. That gave me some serious foundation to my singing journey, um, sidelining with the recording studio experience, which was very fortunate. Um Jagjit Singh Thiraj passed away when I, when I was 16 and then I stopped learning. But what I did was I took a step back and I thought, right, what can I do with this now? And I think I just started to explore with all the knowledge that I had mm -hmm. um, and started thinking, OK, let me improvise. Let me start composing. Let me do this. Let me do that. I actually worked in the uh, radio media field for quite some time. I was a DJ for a short while and I was uh, wow. working within radio stations. centre. <laughs> Yeah, and I was DJing at clubs, and so I was kind of doing this whole other side of media, and and then suddenly I found myself as a presenter on a community radio station with DJ Senator on my show, physically in the studio. Is this is this the Senator who had who had um, a lot of albums back in the I think the Senator, yeah, albums, the DJ Senator was a featured Senate a featured DJ on my show as a presenter. And I just said, I feel like singing to what you're doing. And we did this live DJ versus my voice collaboration. And he, after the show, he said, you, you want to record something for my album? Wow. <laughs> and I went, yeah, sure. Why not? 
And then I debuted on Senator's album, No Way Out, it's back in the day. Uh, there was Nana and Kuli. Oh, do you know Kuli? I was just about to say, I, when I was a kid, <laughs> I used to love that song. I didn't know you sang that. Kuli, Kuli's my debut. And so was Nana on there. Wow. Everyone knows. Especially but, Kuli, that was a massive song that was. Yeah, so that was my debut. Wow. My debut, so... And then ever since, so after that came other projects um, as a lead vocalist. And I still do other projects uh, for, you know, World Fusion and all this Hindi alternative. Um, I think I've got this love for music in such a way I'm still exploring. I'm always exploring. But I do miss that sort of regimented teaching, I think, yeah. because it's formed such a foundation you know, then life happens, personal things happen. And, um, but my connection to music hasn't been lost. Um, I think it was for a little while due to personal experiences, but I think it never really leaves you. So, mm. yes, yeah, so I've always had it in the background. So because my roots were from Keaton, I found myself coming back to Keaton whenever I feel a little bit lost with music. I don't know where I'm heading. Well, I'm, I sit back down with the Vajra or my um, digital Tanpura box. Yeah. And I start kind of um, vibing and sort of kind of coming out with things that I remember and try and really home into with the spirituality side of things. And then I break free again and start over. So, um, yeah, that's kind of... The, the long version of the you know how how my journey was but I think along the way what's happened is after Senator's album No Way Out meant that I was then performing live uh either with him first actually we went to lots of clubs and performed those tracks because they were hit tracks then and then um featured on other albums as well did some covers and I've kind of stopped started my career um but never really stopped fully if that makes sense yeah. Life gets in the way, doesn't it, at times? Yeah. yeah. So here we are. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's that's really cool. Like, it's, it, just to know that about you, especially the Senator bit, I, it's something I didn't know. And uh, <laughs> uh, I used to listen to that song heavily when I was younger. Yeah, <laughs> everyone knows what that is. And it's just, it's so lovely um, that people still remember those tracks. So I remember the starting Senator, Senator. <laughs> that's my really bad impression. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Okay, it's cool. So let's let's move on a bit. I'm going to come back to your singing a bit later, but I just um, I know that you're a songwriter and composer as well. Uh, how did you get into composing and songwriting? So I think composing came through the, you know, the fact that I was surrounded with that recording studio environment. It meant that I saw projects how they were being worked on, how. Uh, a producer would kind of say, can you sing this for me that way? Or how harmonies were being laid or I was hearing pieces of music as they were being worked on. And I think that was quite inspiring for me. And I think with coupled with the experience of singing, coupled with the experience of media, I actually at the age of 20, 21 was so passionate that um, I actually had a home studio of my own at that age. Wow. And I, before singing, more than singing, wanted to get into production. Wow. I only wanted to produce because I felt like when I, when I hear things, so when I'm like, if, for example, I'll put the hoover on, okay, and I'll hear the hum from the hoover and I'll come up with something and that will be, it, it might be just be da, 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 something simple as that. Yeah. But I'll turn it into a phrase, a musical phrase, and then so on and so on. But because I was very passionate at that time, this creativity was unstoppable. So I wanted to keep on producing. I had Cubase back in the day, all set up on the PC, and I had a, a desk and everything. And it was, um, yeah, it was pretty decent. Um, so I think I just found myself sitting in that space or at home with my keyboard, just constantly playing constantly playing in my spare time after school when I woke up I was sat by my keyboard my Casio keyboard in my bedroom or um, the studio setup that I had in a separate space and I was just constantly playing so I think because I could hear these melodies going on and on and on in my head 
I used to think, okay, let me see if I can copy a Bollywood song. Let me see if I can cover this. Let me see if I can play the pieces. And I was very attracted to the pieces. For example, A.R. Rahman's Tal, the movie Tal. Yeah. I was so fascinated by all those pieces. Um, so I used to practice playing them and see, can I do it? Can I do it? And I felt like I could do it. Wow. Um, so the confidence came. The songwriting, I think, came afterwards where I would do a phrase of music and then I'll just think of one word and it will turn into the hook. Um, it might just be, uh, I don't know, I'm just trying to think. For example, there is a song that I've actually done. So I, I remember composing music and all I heard was the word babula, right? And I would just be doing da 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 babula. And that then I would work on the phrase over and over again and see how does that fit yeah. in music. So I'm um, the same. I'm the yeah. same as you. Like, you know, because sometimes people say, oh, oh, did you, who did you write this about? Was this your life experience or this? And I said, I, I just had an interview recently and I said, I said, um, no, it just comes to you. That's yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm very much, like, I know there's writers out there. So I'm working with writers now who I can just say, um, can you can you write me a song about me going to the shop and buying a chocolate? And they will. Yeah. I can't do <laughs> I'm one of those. It has to happen organically. I need to feel. I need to be in that space. And I, I will write. I will songwrite. But for me, it's um, it's a certain headspace I need to be in to be yeah. able to have that happen to me. So I don't know if that's because I'm a singer or because I'm focusing on the melodies or the music pieces. I don't know. But if I was just a writer, I say someone who is just writing creatively all day, I think I'd be different. Um, so I do song, right? Yes. But it's a time and space thing for me. So there's a Hindi song I wrote, Dil Ki Baate, which um, a, a Hindi singer from the UK, Chira Grau sang and the 515 crew, um, band actually performed it and and produced the song um I remember that one I was just sitting in my conservatory um one day and I was just going na 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 like I'm talking na 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 and I just turned it into the songs and the words just kept flowing and before you knew it I think I stopped what I was doing and I just wrote so it's for me I'm a very much it comes to me yeah. type of songwriter or the music comes to me I don't go looking for it but it happens I might be cooking and it will happen yeah uh, it's organic yeah it's, I, I find that like, I get triggered by listening to music so like you listen yes. to music and think oh I've taken the melody somewhere else or taken it into another into total different arena sort of thing and then the song developed from there uh did you yeah. find it's, it's a similar experience or I, I would say yes. So I didn't know. So when I'm listening to Punjabi music, it doesn't happen. <laughs> it happens. It's when not I'm, melodious in it anymore. It used to be. It's, it's, just, it's very similar it's, melodies recently. There is something. It's interesting you've just said that. So I didn't know until I started listening to progressive house music uh, a couple of years ago how effective that music was. Um, and um, yeah, I didn't know how effective that music was. Progressive house music is all about space and music. Very little voice elements. There are voice elements, but there's so much space. And I think for a singer or someone who wants to be creative, you need space. Yeah. So when I have this stuff playing on in the background, there's a journey musically evolving in their music, in that genre, and you end up singing something. And guaranteed, I've always got something coming out of that. Yeah. And That's it's guaranteed creativity yeah. for me. <laughs> Especially, especially the like it's, you mentioned house, uh, especially the crescendo part of it. it it's 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 really good, as you said, the space in between, and you just go in. The build up, yeah, like the build up, the build, the winding down, and then um, I think for me, it's not when it's at its peak. So the build up is really important, or the the winding down, the coming yeah. down of the yeah, track. Um, for me, because I love my melody, so I think for me, it's it's like the rush happens, and then. Da, 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 and I feel it. I feel the drop. I feel that it's happened in that moment. But I wouldn't know. I, I'm not like sort of. Um, it's not. I wouldn't know. I just. I'm not kind of inclined to be working at something when it's at its peak. Yeah. But then saying that, you know, 
if I hear Punjabi music and if I hear a really, really good sick dolgi going on, I'm naturally singing something that's old, classic Punjabi yeah. folk because of what I've listened to growing up. Your Surinder Gaur, Prakash Gaur type songs, and I'm singing those kind of classic numbers. Um, it's just out of habit, out of habit. But um, yeah, the songs come organically. I think that's the answer to your question, that the, the songwriting comes organically. But within that songwriting once I find a phrase I then look for patterns so for example the song that I've just released as you know is Hal Virabha so Hal Virabha remember the phrase the the phrase Hal Virabha was like you know the, the opening the opening of that song was it was a feeling it was a statement it's a question it's like how how do I obtain this love it's a real serious statement. I need to grab someone with attention. And then another question, and then it's like, oh, I'm telling a story. Um, but again, listening to the syllables, are there enough syllables? I'm not overthinking in that initial state. When I'm first drafting, it's just me writing a story. Then I do second draft and then I go back in and I think, right, do the syllables match? Does this even make sense grammatically? Mm. Um you know, Punjabi language in itself is so beautiful as a language that I want to make sure it actually makes sense what I'm saying. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot to look at when you're second and third drafts and so on. But that initial draft is just thoughts and storytelling. That's how I... That's Do you write in English as well, just out of interest? I have started to. <laughs> I really struggle. It's a really it's really strange. Well, I speak I really it hard. Punjabi, but... I can write Punjabi and I just wonder whether you're the same. So I I do struggle. I've started to, but I think it's because, again, I think it's the progressive music that got me to start <clears throat> because they work with just a few lines and it made it easier for me to kind of think, oh, I can do this. <laughs> I can just say what I feel for two lines and yeah. kind of work with and then build on it. So I would say I'm not your commercial English songwriter. I'm not. Um, if it was alternative, if it was fusion, if it was house, I I would say yes, I'm I'm okay with that. But I think initially I found it really cringe, kind of, oh my God, is my writing even okay? Am I being too is this too in your face? Or is it too I don't know. It's there is words, there are words, sorry, there is poetry in English that maybe I need to find a new dictionary on how to how to kind of use those words and make it into a song. I think I suffer from uh, imposter syndrome when it comes to writing in English. Because <laughs> you're just not, okay, does this even make, like, does this even, does it sound cheesy? I just always think it, sounds, it. Cheesy, sounds cheesy. Yeah, I just think, and I think I'm such a romantic at heart as well, Raj. It's one of those things where, oh, I just want to write. I love writing about love. And I'm just like, all of my songs, there's always something to do with the theme of love. So when I put that in English, I just think, nah, it's, nah, it's, it's too cheesy. It's too cheesy. Interestingly, me and my friend did this experiment just just last, uh, not this Friday, the Friday the Friday before that. We was in practice and we was practicing the song, Tu uh, Merizin, Tu Merizin, that song, right? Yeah. Um, practicing that. And um, the, when we looked at the lyrics, there was an English translation right beside it, right? And he goes, why don't you think they try the English? And we actually sang the English translation, <laughs> but to a different melody. Obviously, it wasn't because it wouldn't sit right. on the Indian melody. We sang it to an English melody. And it actually sounded all right. Like, sounded all right. <laughs> yeah, so we don't have to write songs anymore now. We just, in English, we just uh, translate the songs. You, you might have just discovered, a, uncovered a little method there. <laughs> Exactly, yeah, I was like, oh, this sounds right, because he was playing guitar uh, and playing some really like, funky chords and stuff. So, so uh, yeah, it was really interesting. <laughs> you might have caught onto a little secret there. Yeah, but exactly, you yeah. never know. It's true, though. It's, it's, the thing is, it's obviously in Punjabi, things can only be said in a certain way. Same yeah. as Hindi, you can only say it a certain way. You translate it and you're like, what? <laughs> yeah, what are you even on about? But, um Obviously, that's what I'm trying. I think I'm working on that, but it's not it's not necessary for my I think I'm just exploring the song right yeah. right now. But I'm not saying no because you just never know when you need to um kind of go down that road. I tell you what I did do though, um, a few years, quite a few years ago. I wrote, I was quite inspired by Alicia Keys. Um and it was her 
Diary of Alicia Keys album. I was trying to think what it was there. Diary of Alicia Keys. Now, if you listen to the album, she's got little interludes. She's got an intro. She's got speech. She's got her songs. She's got these little music breaks going. I was so, so inspired by that. So at that time, that era for me, I remember mirroring that, but the Sonia Vanessa way. So I did write um, poetry in English, which became speech over music. And I remember performing that many, many years ago at the um, uh, Town Symphony Hall, I think it is in Birmingham. Um, And I did that acoustically. Amazing. It was just... I didn't realize the power of speech, poetry on words. You don't have to sing it. It was just speech. Just amazing. So that was a great experience as well. So I have tried that as well. <laughs> wow, interesting, interesting stuff. So I'm going to move move you on just slightly. Um, uh, so we, we, we discussed about your comp- composing and songwriting. So I'm going to go back into your singing because I, I, I love to learn of people. This is why. So this podcast is sort of me learning of, of, of other <laughs> singers, of your te- some of still your techniques and stuff and, <laughs> and practice them at home. So that's that's why I like asking these questions because I can say, oh, yeah. I've taken that on, you know, or or, or hopefully you might you might get like something a little, little tidbit. Oh, so Rod does this, you know, like, so that kind of thing. Um, so when you said you were at, at the age of four, what yeah. did that uh, uh, entail of? Uh, t- were you just sitting down with a vajar singing the, the singing kirtan or how, yeah how you so i had i was given so we used to go to see the 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 uh, Gyaniji, as i said so Gyaniji would give me um uh, i'm trying to think of something as an example now uh for example the shabad jo mange thakur apnete right so jo mange thakur apnete Soi, soi deve. So, for example, that little melody, he would then give me the notation. So he would say out loud, um, but he'd tell me that it will fit across eight beats in every bar, and he'd tell me how to write that down. Um, so first, that was the initial stage. So he'd he'd sing it, he'd then deliver it to me. You got to remember, he's blind, so it was me writing it down, no. um, understanding what he was saying, writing it down, um, and then putting the words underneath the 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 key notations. So where it was, so I would actually put the spacing of the words underneath as well. I'd take that away go home, practice with the Vajra first, playing the tune. So obviously when you're first learning, you're learning even how to present on a Vajra, for example, you've got your, if you're right-handed like me, left hand pumping the Vajra, playing the keys with my right, making sure I'm playing the, the, the tune right first. Then going back and um, learning the words, the, the words of the actual Shabbat on top. Um, he used to give like just the chorus one week, then the verse the following week and then he'll say right now go learn the whole actual Shabbat which is the full words so by the third or fourth week we'd have a finished Shabbat that's if it was a simple Shabbat however if it was classical he'll then tell me right when you've done verse one you're now going to go into a sargam and or you're going to start with um something like a um like a tehai um and it's like you know it was just the technical kind of classical side of things started to get more and more complicated. Um, And it meant going away and learning, then saying things quite quickly, whatever it was, saying that quickly, but singing it correctly and on time, all of that, there was a lot. Um, And that's just a brief version of that, but you can imagine it, it, it did get, it did get quite quite um, challenging, is the word. Yeah, especially if you're doing you're, you're at school as well, and you're coming home and doing that, and it's it's uh, it's quite demanding. Because uh, did you ever do did you ever do uh, stuff like a uh, uh, sur sadhana, like when you just meditate on notes? No. So I didn't know that that even existed, um, as in as an approach to learning, till. As in, I probably saw it or as in, you see it in films, you saw it on TV that, yeah. you know, certain classical people were learning a certain way. 
<laughs> excuse me. And, um, but it wasn't the way I was taught. So I think, when did I, I'm trying to think now, when did I have my digital tantra? It was years after. So this is after all my learning that, you know, they were like, no, you don't need a vajra anymore. You you know, you go to an instrument shop. No, you don't need a vajra. You just need a digital tantra. I'm like, what? And before you know it, I had a digital tantra. And then I'm sort of sitting there going, wow, what do you do with this? <laughs> Excuse me. <All> right. <laughs> You want some water, meanwhile? You want to get some water? I'm going to get a strep cell. Hang on. Yeah, no worries. Oh, I'll, I'll just pause the recording. Yeah, guys. So, uh, sorry about that. We were just, um, uh, just for the uh, listeners, we're both actually got colds right now. It's, uh, not just me. I've got a cough and, uh, and a sore throat. And, and Sonia's uh, not been well for about a week or two, isn't it, uh, Sonia? Oh, it's been on and off. It's been on and off. But we're determined, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we were so uh, uh, enthused. And I, I was, I, I, to be fair, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to talk to you. And because and, I'm already finding it insightful, uh, just your journey in music. And we were talking about suicide now because I had that similar experience to you. Say, so, well, because my latest teacher was to tell me, no, you, you, you can't, you're not allowed to use the harmonium. Yes. <laughs> I, I think the thing is, when you're learning with Kirtan, Kirtan traditionally in the Gurdwara is done with the Vajra. Of course, yeah. However, the original Sangeet form, from what I understand, comes from the original days of people only singing to a Tanpura, original Tanpura, um, sitar sounds and so on. So I'm talking about many, many moons ago. Yeah. So that traditional sort of sadhana, what you're talking about, is probably the most authentic way of learning Sangeet and the probably best practice, and hence why it's kind of travelled down all these centuries and so on, through myths and through stories, you know, through religious stories and otherwise. You you hear it through... Um, you know that that they did a divan. A divan is like you know, like a, a, I suppose another word is a mephil, I suppose if in the more common term now, uh, dibard or whatever, and darbar, sorry. And they they have just music playing with different instruments. But back in the day, what what did they do when they didn't have so many instruments? They would focus on a single sound, probably. So I feel like that is the most original way. And probably the best way, because as an artist now, looking back, had I been taught that way, I think that's a whole different way of learning. You're learning to fine tune your own hearing to a single sound, then to find your own notes of the scale of yep. the keys and to make sure they're in tune by yourself. So you're brain training. Um, so there's a lot of brain training going on, um, which you know, and a lot of memory training going on for you before you even sing. I'm not saying that doesn't happen with the Vajra. With the Vajra, you've got the dependency of playing the key. Yeah. So I was using that as a crutch. Yeah. It's almost about a Vajra. I'm, I'm not saying it's the wrong or... or no, like, no, exactly. I'm saying it's different. Whereas, like, the more intense you get, the less um, uh, accompanying instruments you have apart from the Tampura. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think now that I have... I would say I still haven't had enough experience with learning the, the Tanbra way. However, I do love Fariyaz now. It's it's actually quite meditative. Mm. Um, so I remember when my eldest is born, I've got a 13-year-old and a 9-year-old. When my 13-year-old was born, he was a few months old, five months old maybe. And at that point, I remember him getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning and he wants his milk. So he's had a bottle of milk and I would used to go inside room. He used to be laid down having his milk. I'd put the Dunbra on and I used to do Riyaz at 5, 5.30 in the morning. And I tell you what, time, I had no idea of time. Wow. I had no idea. I just knew that he drank his bottle. He was done, but he was happy and playful, carried on singing. I think I got back into that Riyaz at that point really well. But with the Tanpura, because it became a healing thing for me as well. Um, and he was really, as a baby, was really playful. So it was just like, I think it kind of helped that there was music in the room. I was doing my thing. My baby's happy. I'm happy. Mm. And we're in this space of sound. And I think we underestimate the power of sound. So 
going back to what you're saying um obviously everyone's got their personal take on these things but I think I feel like we should as singers and artists we should explore that if we haven't already the vajjo is amazing to learn because you're learning keys you're learning theory I'm not I'm not mocking that at all I think I've learned so much I wouldn't be who I am without that training I still think it's restrictive because you're waiting for that sound to happen for you to sing it yeah um So I know that for now, for example, when I'm learning a new song uh, that maybe is already out, if I need to perform it at a wedding or something, I'll listen to it. But what am I doing? I'm still listening to the notes before uh, before kind of singing it myself. So what I do is then I go onto my piano or my vajra now. I'll play it first to make sure I've got a good understanding before I sing it. That's the way I do it now. But the tanpra, the digital tanpra, that you're kind of talking about that experience what that does it's <coughs> it kind of excuse me it um it kind of gives you that you just zone out mm-hmm. you go find where you are you're free um you're not restricted by anything and you allow your voice to open up but you're also mentally opening up in that space so i think it's really important that sur sadhana practice is really important um if you want longevity i think it's really important absolutely did, did you were, were you given like bolte and stuff to practice so bolte is like basically uh well i know you know what, what they are i'm just talking to you i know go for it go for it just just the audience uh listens so a bolte basically runs so you've got like so you say sare sare ga re ga ga ma and so on so that's that's what just for the listeners that's what bolte is uh, in 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 the technical term do you were you given those to do as well yes i was so again not through keith and training they they were kind of added in as part of the particular shabads that i was working on but when i uh, for a short period of time i did um try and work with a couple of female uh, teachers this is much 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 like i'm talking about maybe only in the last 15 years i would say yeah. i must have contacted a couple of different teachers just trying trying to get back into this practice of riyaz and um with that they gave the alangars and the balde and so on and it's uh, a lot of discipline required to to do that um i feel they are important they are really really important it, you know it's for your muscles and your throat your face everything the mouth itself just to be able to say those words the speech you need to work on that for clarity Yeah. not just of the voice but of what you're saying so it's really really important that's so insightful side you actually because like that's one of the things I've had to relearn when you're learning classical just the shape of your 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 mouth when you're pronouncing a certain letter of vowel so for example so um, if you're doing a if you're saying a r uh, you can't uh, you can't have your mouth bent just if you bend your mouth a bit you yeah. you, you go out, out of key yeah you'll get a different yeah. key and um sorry Okay, Norris. Oh my goodness, me. You mean to pause again or Yeah, pause again. I'm so sorry. Yeah, so uh, what we're saying was about the uh, uh, the uh, you were describing the exp- the expression of your well, the shape of your mouth it may take you off pitch. Yeah, so gosh. I think I paid more attention to this when I was trying to learn bollywood songs uh, for performances and the reason why um you'd have things like the word ha or hi um saying ha or a a is a classic one oh my goodness right so when we do any sort of riyaz any sort of vocal practice a lot of people tend to go uh when they're singing so you don't realize they go ah eyes are but they tend to close their mouth and it becomes a uh. so it ends up going ah and it goes into a uh sound and we don't realize that's not correct so if you're going for an ah you're saying ah so in western singing uh practice i've understood that they do the vowels deliberately yes they a e i o u because they want you to open up your mouth muscles and make sure you've got those vowels because that's where the pronunciation of your words is coming from from those vowels if we did the the, the literal thing in indian um form we would be doing a uh, a e e u u and so on yeah. and that's a good practice as well but 
we need to make sure we're clear on what we're saying. So are, not a. Uh. Another thing I had a tendency, I didn't know I was doing, instead of ah, I was doing ha. Huh. <laughs> so I was going, ha. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, it's not ha, huh. it's ah. Uh. It's, you know, and then not having the nasal ending, making sure it's clear. There's so many things that can actually, with a few changes, you can you can really change the way what, you know, how you sound and get the clarity that you really need. Um, but it's like you said, it's really important. The minute you close your mouth, it changes the tone, the key, the pronunciation of the word. A lot of the Indian words, Punjabi words, the minute you've got a nasal end, it changes the meaning of the actual word. So, uh, you know, gala is not even an existing word, but gala, there is a word yeah. with the nasal ending. So you've got to make sure you're saying it right. So it's so important. It's so insightful when you really break it down. How important all of that practice really is that, then that, of course that, yeah, so, yeah. Go on. i was just gonna say that's an interesting point pronunciation because um uh being brought born here did you struggle with the pronunciation bit <laughs> no because i learned punjabi as well <laughs> yeah so i learned to um well learn punjabi reading writing speaking um and um yeah i even sat the exams and everything so yeah i've done it done it properly um up to a level but not again that was a choice I, i'm really passionate about the language that i just wanted to keep i found it amazing um so yeah it, it's really helped I'm not saying you have to, but you definitely need to have a good grasp of language. So now, like when we do, I do my performances with my um, uh, Punjabi folk band. I'm not sure if you're aware, but I am a lead vocal. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, when we get on the but when we do that, for example, people who ever met me, and I just come on the mic and I'm singing the real sort of you know Punjabi folk numbers, and then afterwards, they're, oh. They're like, where are you from? I'm like, uh, I'm born here. And when I speak English, like, oh, <laughs> you're really from here. Yes, I am. But it's it's I feel flattered. I feel really um it's it's really heartwarming to know that the language um that I'm able to pronounce it in a way that they feel it comes from homeland, really. Yeah. And how important do you think that is like for anyone else who who wants to sing? Uh, today to learn the language properly okay so yeah it is important I would say it also depends on the styles that you're working with so if you're going traditional learn it traditionally if you're going with a western approach or a pop approach it's not terrible but make sure you understand the language so that you're not singing it grammatically incorrect or you're actually making sense if you're songwriting yeah. um, it's really important that you're making sense um I know that generally speaking for many, many years, the male uh, artists have been singing female perspective songs and it seems to be accepted for many, many years. But now there's a lot more female artists out there. Some people are now sort of thinking, oh, okay, it, it's, it makes sense when a female sings it, but it doesn't stop. Um, it still happens. But um, yeah, I think it's I think it's just really, it's, it's definitely worth knowing the language that you're working I think it's really it helps it's never not going to be helpful mm. it's like um I sing in Punjabi Hindi I have sung in Gujarati and Swahili really? oh. yeah um I do understand Gujarati and I do understand very very little not much Swahili um but if I'm working on a song I want to know what it means and then I study the way it's kind of said pronunciation wise yeah I, it's never going to be perfect because I'm not from those regions or the, 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 the language or the culture isn't around me firsthand, but I certainly try and adopt it. You're very much like me in that way, sort of, uh, uh, I'm just constantly learning and I'll, yeah. I always have a Punjabi dictionary on my phone. So yeah. if I'm not, <laughs> yeah, if I don't know the word, what's this mean? Oh, how, how exactly would you pronounce this word? And you look at the Punjabi dictionary, then you can see the the with the be the be on there or or, or the Hindi on there or, or, or you know. I can't, but to, to be fair, I can't even remember my Punjabi alphabet what they're called. <laughs> I, I recognize the sounds. Yeah. 
it's been that long since I've learnt le- Punjabi. I recognise the sounds, but yeah. you tell me which is a, a BRD, CRD. I can't remember which one's which. <laughs> but, you, but you know what the sounds are, right? Yeah, I know what the sound is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's how I... Yeah, yeah. I, I was nothing... after you, sorry. Sorry, no, I was going to say, um, along with the Sihari Bihari comment that you just made, it's important to know the male and female differences. Yes, yes. That's it's one of the biggest things, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, definitely is. Yeah, so. the, 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 and the, the problem is in English, you haven't got masculine and feminine, whereas other languages in, in French and, and Punjabi, Urdu, you've got masculine and feminine terms. So... Yeah, no, they, I mean, other languages, they do have masculine and feminine, but we, I, mean, I think in English, we take it for granted. <laughs> we don't realise. But um, I remember studying French at school. So, yeah, I remember the the le and the la difference. And oh, it, it's, there are there are differences, but it, it's when you really go into the language that you, you're really learning um, how it's said, the singular, the plural, so it's, it's all important. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna move away from slightly from from singing. I can talk to you all day. So I'm really, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, it's something I'm passionate about and I enjoy and I enjoy learning from you. And it's really uh, um, informative to me of how you how how, yeah. you're learning, how you learn and the, the tips you do. But I'm gonna move away because I'm, I'm conscious of time as well. So um, as a woman, what barriers did you have you come across in the Bangla industry? <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't on the list of questions this was I'll just sort of drop this in wow okay so okay uh barriers there so okay. this is a whole I said this literally last week on a radio show where I said this is a whole discussion in itself a separate platform is needed just to talk about this the barriers could be they could be as simple as um I just don't know where to start if I'm really honest. I'm, like my, my head's exploding. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna prompt you, I'm gonna help point. you. So yeah. the first thing you said earlier on that there's there's there are women artists, but I don't think they're actually in the UK, there's not many actual women women artists who, who are prominent. So I think you're right in terms of born and bred UK yeah, that's what I, mean, artists. Yeah. I think you're right there. I think um, due to migration, and I'll say that, I sound like a politician now, but due to migration, we have people coming over from India and other areas um, of the world coming here yeah. and then them starting a career in Punjabi, Bhangra, whatever. Um, we've probably got more of those, but, Punjab, but UK born bred female Punjabi singers, there's probably not many that I'm aware of no. either. Um, there are Hindi singers that I'm aware of a few, um, but yeah, not many that I'm aware of. Because you remember in the, in the early '90s when we had Network East and stuff, there were there were loads then. Do yeah, you... they were, but again, again, not that many. But they're more than many. now because I also, I also remember like and saying that they were like fusion. Do uh, you remember that? Um, was it was it uh, uh, Sangeeta? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, amazing. So, uh, yeah, Sangeetha's amazing. So she's probably the last major Punjabi artist that I would say from a British Punjabi yeah. music industry perspective, I think that's what you're trying to get at. Um, there have been others, but I don't think they've been promoted or maybe not even gone down yeah. uh, or taken the careers, uh, maybe as far as maybe myself or other artists. I don't know. It's a, it's a really tricky one. Um, I'm going to say that when I've been going out performing, for example, there's been questions from really distant family members. I remember a real distant auntie of mine saying, oh, gosh, how are you going to do it now that you have kids? And I said, well, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> if I want to do it, I'll do it. I'll make it work. Um, so I think personal lives can be a hindrance. There's this expectation that you have children, you stay at home. I am fortunate. I have a family full of music uh, musicians and music loving. So music appreciating, it's all in our genes. Um, so that barrier, I didn't need to overcome. It was never, my parents didn't want me to do music. I, I haven't got that story to tell. It's my mum introduced me to music. I'm here and music lives on in our family. The barrier, I would say, if from an industry side of things, in terms of trying to make it out there, it starts with things like financial backing. 
um, back in the day, I say back in the day when Senator's album and things like that happened, you know, people were like, oh gosh, yeah, let's get you to this label. Let's get you conversation with that label. There was money being negotiated. There was um, contracts being negotiated. Um, there was money as a driving force then where people used to get paid a lump sum for an album, lump sum for this, lump sum for that. But it was always a who you know situation. I had to know somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody to get to that somebody at the top of that record label chain. And then I went to a few kind of um, events where it was a networking event, things like that. I don't know why things never worked out, but I remember also auditioning for a label to become their artist. Um, and I did the audition. They loved me. They absolutely, we shook hands. Everything was ready. And as I left their um, studio premises, their, one of their questions as I was leave, leaving them was, um, oh, we just want to quickly ask, would you be okay to um, kind of shoot videos wearing like short clothes and are you okay showing mm -hmm. flesh? And at that time, I'm not saying I am now, but at that time, my mindset was, no, I'm not okay with that. And um, I said, no, I, I, I don't wish to. I wish to be fully clothed or appropriately clothed. I don't want to, you know, show short anything. Um, and they said, okay, we'll be in touch. I never heard from them ever again. So wow. that's one story. That's one story. Then I would say along the lines, further along the line, unfortunately, I have seen, I have observed a lot of ego amongst the industry. There, It is a male-dominated industry. Yeah. There is a lot of ego over pride and possession of this is my track, this is my music, this is my this, this is my that. I did this, I did that. There's a lot of this, or I don't speak to that person because of it. There's a lot of that going on in this industry. And it's a whole nother topic, like I said. So when you're hanging around certain people and you're part of this kind of circle and you're kind of networking and then people are approaching that network to jump on board a certain platform, but suddenly when your partnership or friendships and things break away from that circle, Unfortunately, I have seen that that whole kind of connection has parted ways as well. Wow. So what I'm trying to say here in without going into the detail is it's a shame that the industry don't look at the talent. They look at the who are you connected to. That's so true. Rather than the talent. Yeah, it's so true. Okay, And I'm saying this because. People like yourself, people that I'm seeing recently, speaking to recently, this is Sonia, you're so talented. Um, and it's great to see you're still here. You're still doing, I'm like, yeah, I'm still doing my thing. I'm still doing my thing. Um, it's just a shame that people can't look past the egos, look past the drama, look past the once upon a time I was in touch with that person or that person or associated with that person. I am Sonia Bonessa. You are Raj Kaur. You are you. I am me. I am an artist. I sing like this. I songwrite like this. Look at the talent, guys and girls, but look at the talent. Approach me for the talent, not, you know, for other, not because of stuff that happened or stuff that mm. didn't sit right because of ego. Sadly, that is a huge barrier because what that has meant is that you, you spend so much time, Raj, you understand. It takes time to build an audience. It takes time to build yeah. fan base, um, social media presence, um, actual gig presence out there, um, affiliates in the industry, people on your side helping you and steering you and guiding you. It takes years and years and years. And suddenly for you not to have it, it's a barrier. Mm -hmm. So that I found is, is something that I have experienced Another barrier very quickly, being a woman, um, is that, you know, you've got, you've got males that, uh, sorry, Raj, but you've got males that. No, 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 you go for it. You know, no, they, you know, they, they just, oh, okay, you sing and they, they look at you, they try and, okay, we'll, we'll do this for you. We'll do that for you. But they, it comes with an agenda, uh, a personal agenda. I'm like, no, I just want to do my work. Like I'm here for business. Oh, it's quite unprofessional. It, 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 that's what you say without getting. Sadly, you know. sadly. And, and it's, it's hard to stay firm. And then you think, oh, do, you know, do I need a manager? Maybe I need a manager. Or... Well, I wish I'd, 
I, I wish I can say I, I know what that's like, but I actually <laughs> don't. So I'm, I'm, I'm no, not going to. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to be sort of saying, "Oh, yeah, that must be," because uh, I don't know what it's like. I've never, no. I've never been, uh, I've never had that experience. So no, so that so there are barriers, um, but I think so. Uh, I, I would say they they're just a few things I've highlighted. But it doesn't stop me. I think so. It depends on who you are as a person. It doesn't stop me. I haven't stopped singing. I'm still doing my thing because I'm dedicated to my art form in the way that I am. Um, so I will always come back to it. Um, and yeah, there are always people on social media. There's been times where um, people in the industry, oh, where are all the female artists? And we all put our hand up and hello, we're here. Yeah, I I find that in general, not not just female artists, like in, in, even in now the Bangladesh industry, where people say, "Oh, there's no singers here and stuff." In the UK, well, there are, but they you, you, they, they they're not marketable. I'm saying that in quotations for the listeners. They they, they might not be. They how can I explain this? They might not be popular. So because basically, people want popular people. But how does one get popular? So yeah, this is a great exactly. discussion. How does one get popular? To become popular, your music has to be out there. You need to be performing out there, which requires financial backing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so, catch-22, isn't it? Catch-22. So you can go round and round and round on this question. My ultimate answer is finances. Once upon a time, labels used to put money behind an artist. They don't anymore. Yeah. This is why you see the the rise of independent artists and probably why we're not seeing as many female artists now born and bred from the UK taking it seriously because you know what it's not a joke yeah. you've it's not just about singing anymore it's there's so much more and Raj I'm sure you can appreciate there's social media you've got to become your own PR person yeah you've got to be your own Rial's person you've got to be your own um you got to look after your image you got to look after you know and that this is all money by the way you know even me turning up today it, it is what it is you know outfit I'm thinking okay hair makeup whatever for a woman I'm not sure if you do the same but I'm thinking all of this um you know and that's just before I've turned up for a, a podcast interview imagine I'm going to a gig that's a whole separate situation then I'm thinking okay I need money for musicians exactly. I'm charging this up everything comes from money so if you if you haven't got the financial backing I need to find that money from somewhere myself yeah. and get it out there I mean, like sort of my, 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 my view on that recently is is uh, um, like I'm happy that social media is making it change if you put the work in social media which we are now that's changing because we don't need to be dictated you you don't need to go through any bad experience with labels again now that's no. a positive side of it yeah yeah so you can sort of like like you can sort of create your own hype now you can create your own 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 pr because i because I, when you mention money I, I was quite weird i think for one of my first tracks um i think was it i'm gonna be straight up here a thousand pound to get the tracks played on radio and when i looked at their social media presence they hardly had any followers 140 followers so i thought well why am I paying thousand pounds when you haven't got that yourself? For anyone listening, because, and I'm sure this is still correct to date, you shouldn't be paying anyone to play music. I'm just saying that out loud. No, it's not paying the, the music, but you know, a PR, a PR person. A PR person. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah sorry. I thought person. you meant no, paying, uh, paying no, a radio station. No, 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 I don't mean that. No, oh, I, I don't okay. mean paying a radio. I mean like a PR sorry, person. A PR company. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, PR exactly. Company. A PR company would charge and, um, uh, yeah prices vary I I'll be honest uh, for example the last single I did my own PR myself yeah. um, and I'm proud of it because yeah it took hard work it's a lot of hard work I'm not saying um it would have been nice to have a team doing that for me but um you've you've got it's money <laughs> it's, yeah. bottom line it's money at the end of the day but um but it shouldn't be. This is this is my issue. You shouldn't have gatekeepers. Do you know no, what I mean? Yeah. It, it, it's a gatekeeper. Ultimately, gatekeeper. Where if you pay the gatekeeper enough money, then you got you got those. You remember you said about your network. That network's yeah. broken. Yeah, so yeah. you've got gatekeepers who are who are in charge of that. Like that shouldn't be the case where you can't get your stuff if it's good enough. Obviously, yeah. we're, we're saying if your music's good enough, that that's because sometimes your music's not good enough, or it might not be to everyone's taste. 
which is all right. But then because you've got these gatekeepers who are stopping you from doing that, that's that's the annoyance for an artist as me. It is. It really is. And it's um, you just reminded me of something and I think it's slightly off topic, but I'm just remember as a barrier. Sorry, I've gone back one step. Another thing recently. So um, and I don't know if it's just because I'm a female artist or if I'm just an artist. I don't know. But you know what? We The world is a smaller place now. We're all on social media. OK, if I wanted to reach out to you, Raj, and say, hey, Raj, I'm an independent artist. Would you consider a collab or is there any chance we can have a chat? So the world is a smaller place. And I feel like, you know, we've got artists that have clearly written business inquiries, collab inquiries, get in touch. Da, 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 da. They've got it all displayed. So my pet hate right now, and I'm saying it out loud, is when I am contacting you guys, whoever you are, I'm not saying who. There's lots of people I've contacted there's a lot of people that don't respond or acknowledge. And it's like, hello, why say collab inquiries? Why say business inquiries on such and such email or a message or whatever, when you're not even going to pick that up? It's a lost opportunity, I think. I'm not saying you have to work with me, but you know what? Pick that phone up or respond and say, thanks, not interested or not now or whatever. <laughs> anything, just an acknowledgement would be great. That is a huge barrier overall that is a real pet hate for me right now. Yeah. Have the courtesy, uh, just, just a second. It. You know, thanks for your time. I actually haven't got time or, or whatever reason, you know, which is fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, you know what? Acknowledgement can go a lot further. Um I feel I just think it's etiquette, but that's just my view. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm in your uh, in your camp in, in in that sense, like sort of at least have because because good manners takes you a long long way, doesn't it? Just <laughs> yeah, and sadly there are artists um, out there who are big and they do have managers and so on. And I'm not look, I'm not knocking that. I'm sure it's an amazing experience to be up there. I'm not saying that, but don't forget you've come from there too, you know, and just kind of consider it, consider it. What's the harm? It takes five minutes of your day to look at a message or to look at some links somebody might have provided and just give a nice response. I'm not saying I didn't, I had a, um, a couple of people that did message back and just say, you know what, this is going on for this person. Sorry, we can't take on. And you know what, respect that person for saying so. At least I got a response. Exactly, yeah. That's, That's what it. Anyway, yeah. we're, we're over an hour now, Sonia. So I'm gonna. Sorry. I'm, I'm gonna, no, it's okay. I can carry on for two hours, but I'm just thinking. Um, uh, 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 I don't know. We're damn done, Donna. So, was, <laughs> right. so uh, tell me about uh, 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 your folk band. Yeah. So Team Sursangit is um, our. I say our. It's mine and my brother's London-based um, Punjabi folk band with a contemporary twist. That's our kind of strap line um so it consists of me my brother who is uh, bobby panissa or panissa <laughs> um mm-hmm. and my uh co-vocalist vinnie ridley guitarist danny we are the uh, original team we have other musicians that come on board depending on budgets by clients and so on um but we are predominantly serving the UK and international, because we have done an international Sangeet as well, um, where we are doing mostly wedding Sangeet. So your pre-wedding parties, your juggle nights um, and your Sangeet elements. And, um, you know, we start with the all important traditional numbers and make sure everyone's up there raving on the dance floor, men, women, all ages from top to bottom. So that's what we do. Um, but we do Punjabi mehfils, we do like lori functions, birthdays and so on, but predominantly Punjabi folk. Well, how did you get into that? How did I get into that? So again, <laughs> sidelining everything else. <laughs> um, so we, as a family, because of the music family, we, we've we seen a lot of weddings take place. Uh, obviously, we all went as a family, you do. And my mum uh, used to sing with the Tolki a lot back in the day and, um, you know, sing all these traditional wedding songs. And then Kojit Bamra's mum, Mehinder Pamra, the queen of Giddha Pao Handio, yeah? The voice behind that. So she's obviously been doing it for absolutely ages. And I've seen her as a, a totally admire, having had the privilege of seeing her in our family, singing all those traditional songs. And... Um, 
so yeah, one day, I can't remember what the turning point was exactly, but I just remember being approached by a couple of musicians saying, do you know what, Son, just do some Sangeets. You're really good at your, your Punjabi, you know, your, your Punjabi is really good. Mm-hmm. Just get back out there. And I think it was when my son was a couple of years old and it was just kind of having something to do whilst I was a stay-at-home mum. And I did a couple with just the dolki and the jamcha. Yeah. And uh, slowly, slowly, before you know it, got my brother involved. And um, then he he named the team, Team Sursangeet. And we, we turned it around and we're now travelling up and down the country doing weddings. <laughs> So guys, listeners, if you if you if you want a source of geek, well, if you want a folk uh, band for your occasion, so you know who to call, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm, really, uh, I'm just finishing off here now, just on your track Hal Viraba. How did that song come about, and what was the process behind that? Okay, so Hal Viraba uh, is my baby. It's my my baby because out of all the songwriting I've ever done, it's the first Punjabi song I ever wrote. So I've written so many songs. Yeah. It's not only the first one that I wrote, as in out of all my series of Punjabi songs, it's also the first one that got released. So I'm very mm. kind of attached to this song. Um, I wrote it many, many moons ago. Uh, probably, actually, I won't, I won't give a time and date because I, I probably got it wrong. But it was quite a while ago. And it was an expression of a feeling. The story behind it is a girl... Um, having like a real deep roller coaster emotional crush on um, this guy. And um, I just ended up writing this whole thing on paper. I don't remember where it came from. It just happened. Well, I do know where it came from. It came from experience. And I wrote it down on paper. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then I turned it into a song. I was playing it on the Vajra like a guzzle, actually, back in the day. I remember learning, like wow. singing the same tune, but it was very guzzly on the Vajra. And then um, years later or something, I just remember meeting up with um, the producer, Saib G, and, and just gave him the song and sort of said, here, have a listen to this. And he's like, that's really good, you know, like the melody is really nice and this. And he's like, okay, let me see if I can work on it. So off he went. And he got so into it that he then came back and was like, son, the music's done. I'm like, what do you mean the music's done? The music's done, like, within a week. Wow. Um, and back in the day, that was that's some serious progress made in a week. Um, and, uh, and, and that's it. And it, he gave it the drum and bass vibe. Um, he's a guitarist himself, um, so he had a lot of the guitar sounds, electronic sounds as well. Um, and he sourced musicians from India, got some pieces played. And then he was like, right, son, it's time for you to lay down the vocals. I'm like, okay, we're doing this. <laughs> and then before you know it, we've recorded the track. And um, I'm not going to lie, the track was sitting on the shelf for a little while. And then we revisited. And just over the last few years, I think I've been so attached. I was like, no. I've, I've had a gap in my releasing of songs and I want to come back with Hal and Abba. Yeah. This is personal to me. So lo and behold, last year, 2022, I spent time getting the video team, getting, you know, the creative side of things. So I thought, you know, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it a bit big. And um, we made it happen. So we have a video for it. And um, it was shot in West London the song was uh, re kind of worked on again a little bit more and then mixed mastered in London as well at uh, Saib G Studio, Cannes Studio in London. And here we go. We've got a finished song and it's out, <laughs> literally. So how did the video come about, the concept and everything else? And- yeah, so the concepts, as I said to you, I think at the beginning of the podcast, like my, my ideas are very organic. It, they come to me, but... So this was a feeling I had, yeah. um, you know, for someone remembering someone or feeling that kind of crush moment. And I wrote it in words. It came out in Punjabi. Wow. <laughs> it came out in Punjabi. And um, and I don't know the, the the depth of the words. I think I wrote a lot more originally. Like I wrote like an A4 page of what I was feeling, but um, in that moment, but kind of condensed it into the song and I applied the same rule as I said to you earlier you know kind of looking out for the syllables looking out for the pattern but the melody was really nice for me I just thought gosh it's really different 
it's not your typical yeah. Punjabi melody. It's not your Bhangra. It's not all that. I, and I go with my gut with these things. I just think, okay, that's how I like it. Yeah. And I liked it. And then when Saib Ji heard it, he was like, I like it. So it's very catchy, especially the, yeah. the, the, the chorus is really memorable. Like, it, it's, it's in my head, like even now when we're talking. So, I, I, yeah. in my head. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I said this at my radio interview last week, and I'm going to say it here as well. I totally underestimated the power of that hook line. Mm-hmm. And um, I've actually had the feedback has been. Um, like some of my friends they've called me like they don't even say hello they'll just say ha <laughs> and I'm like oh my god is it really stuck they're saying yes and I've had other people uh, from some of my audiences my followers and they're like you know what great track we love ha levida bar like they remember the hook line so I feel like you have to be authentic you know and and be yourself and I I'm so glad that I left it as it was and didn't try and make it commercial, overly yeah. commercial, overly typically Bhangra or anything. It was a feeling, it was an expression, and I left it as that. Well, amazing. So, yeah. so, I'm <laughs> going to wrap it up now. So what's in the future? What's next for, for Sonia? So I'm working on oh, so many different projects right now. Um, <laughs> excuse me. I am working on um, a bunch of different tracks, different flavours. Um and an EP hopefully. Oh wow! <laughs> so so what time are we looking at this EP? I I, I wish I could say tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. I understand. It's a labour of love. It, it's it's one of those things. I think I'm working differently this time around, though, Raj. I think um I've done so much exploration, but I'm trying to. I've got a goal, uh, a, a goal with my singing. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I've got a goal which I'm trying to reach and I think because my goal is clear now um, I'm kind of making sure that I'm not missing a trick and I'm trying to now release music heading that way. Brilliant, brilliant. So Sonia, um, I, I, I would say I'd actually like to carry on the podcast but it, it, the, this podcast will be four hours <laughs> Kevin and chatting to me. So I am actually in the cut. I think we've been over an hour, maybe hour and a uh, hour and a half. Believe it or not, the time's flown. Yeah, ex- exactly. Tea time so- now. <laughs> <laughs> it's tea time now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd like to carry on, but it's uh, I'd, literally up. If, if I carry on talking to you, I'm going to be here until probably nine o'clock in the evening because <laughs> I've got so much else to talk to you. But we can do another one one day. And absolutely can, yeah, anytime can absolutely yeah. and yeah no this has been amazing thank you so much you've really made me think about my journey and um yeah and i've learned from you as well a new trick to look at the literate the translation of a punjabi song yes. <laughs> I, I might take that away and try that <laughs> yeah. that has happened last week and said a week or two ago so uh, i like that yeah. idea yeah. Anyway, Sonia, bless you. Absolutely, absolute privilege talking to you. And uh, and honestly, from the bottom of my heart, wish you the best in the future. And hopefully, I can't wait to hear your 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 uh, latest stuff coming out. Your your new Thank stuff. Thank you very much, Raj. Thank you bless very you. much. God bless you. <laughs> Love you talking care. to you. you. And that, guys, is my podcast with Sonia Panesar. And if you can, make sure you follow it on your social. So when uh, if I if this is on Instagram. Or, or on TikTok, I'll, uh, you can see Sonia's profile on there. I'll tag it in. Make sure you give her a follow. Make sure you listen to her songs. And if you can drop us a review on whether it's podcasts, uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify on YouTube, drop us a comment, drop us a share. Uh, that's absolutely fantastic if you can do that for me. Um, that's just a little uh, thing to help us push us up the charts and get get us a bit a bit, a bit more traction. That's if you enjoy the podcast. If you don't enjoy the podcast, then I end up playing it. That's all right as well. <laughs> but I'm sure you will. All right. God bless you all and thank you.